Okay, guys, time to get rolling. I am super excited for tonight. Uh, my name is Jennifer McInnes. I'm the Vice President of Growth and Marketing at Sonoran Desert Institute. First of all, thank you, thank you for being here tonight, you guys. We really, really appreciate it. Um, we've had a bunch of people just pour in over the last couple minutes. So for my early birds, again, sorry you're hearing this spiel for now the third or fourth time. Um, but just to catch everybody up, this is how it's going to go down tonight. Um, we're going to have an audio uh, webinar here. Um, and because there are over a hundred of you guys on the line tonight, all of you guys are going to be muted, which means that the way you're communicating with me and then uh, through me, Gabe, is going to be through the questions section of your GoToWebinar dashboard. So hop on over there. Um, you'll see a couple different options. One of them is the word questions. Typically, it will have a, an arrow next to it. Um, you'll go ahead and select that arrow to expand the section. You can type your questions in right there. I'm going to be kind of um, moderating the whole thing tonight, uh, keeping an eye on all the questions and seeing how many we can get through. Um, we'll be here, you know, a whole hour tonight, um, and, and I really will try to get to as many of them as I possibly can. Um, I thank you in advance for your patience, though. There will probably be a lot of questions, so I may not respond right at the second that you post it. Just give me a little bit of time, and I'll try to get to everybody, even just to say, I'll ask him, or, you know, something along those lines. Um, like I said, I appreciate your patience on that. So without further ado, um, we're going to go ahead and get rolling here. And one of the first things that, you know, my, my recurring attendees here will know is that we're going to talk quickly about Sonoran Desert Institute and then quickly about Gabe. And then we are launching into the content tonight because we've got a ton to cover. So um, if you're not familiar with SDI, uh, we are a DEAC accredited online firearms school. Um, and what that means is we offer a couple different programs and courses that you take from the convenience of your home. Um, all of your classroom work is submitted online. We do ship tools and materials and resources to your door to work on the hands-on labs and things like that. Um, we have two main programs here, Associate of Science and Firearms Technology degree. That's our 60 credit course and our highest credential. Um, we also have the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate, 32 credit hours. Both of those are approved for use of most TA and VA benefits, if that interests you at all. And additionally, that um, Associate of Science and Firearms Technology degree program um, is approved. Uh, eligible students within that program um, may be able to receive Title IV funding, which is called Federal Student Aid, or FSA. Um, so if that helps you out at all, we are happy to walk you through that process. Um, really, any of, any of those funding options. Uh, our admissions team, student services team, and financial services teams are more than happy to help you with that. Uh, we do have a non-credit a non-credit ballistics and reloading certificate course as well, um, and then th and then uh, standalone course options that um, you can take either by themselves or within the advanced gunsmithing certificate or the degree program. Now, um, I know I'm going to probably open a can of worms here right now. The 1911 Advanced Armor course is not uh, available as a standalone course right now. However, we are feverishly working on getting that back as a standalone course. It is currently, and just to be very clear, everybody turn your ears on if you're a current student, um, you still can select 1911 as your capstone course in the Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate or the degree program. So never fear if you're already in those programs and you want that as your capstone. capstone still totally okay to do that. Um, we're just waiting on a couple little loose details to pull that 1911 back into a standalone option. So um, down at the bottom there, I do want to talk about uh, field study opportunities as well, um, particularly because tonight's guest, Gabe Wren, um, is offering one of those at his location as well. So we have um, right around a dozen, a little bit more than a dozen um, current field study partners nationwide all over the place. We try to spread them out a little bit. Um, and they all kind of, the neat thing is um, they're, they're two to four week on site field study opportunities, which is kind of like an externship. So um, to supplement your education, you can select to do these two to four week processes. Um, you'll learn hands on on site. Um, it doesn't cost any tuition money for the student, but you are responsible for any tra travel and housing, you know, that you would have to um, think about while you're on site there. So um, if you find one of these partners or you're interested in looking into that, um, a lot of guys do a local opportunity if you are lucky enough to have one of those. And if not, just make sure you're kind of keeping an eye on that type of thing. But we highly, highly recommend these field studies because they're just absolutely amazing as far as an opportunity goes. So 
If you want more information about the field study, um, op the field study options that we have, you see the email address right there, fieldstudy at sci.edu. Feel free to reach out to us directly. Or if you want to kind of peruse, totally fine as well, go to sci.edu. Way up at the top of the homepage, you'll see a green current students button. Click that button um, and you'll see a field studies segment of that page. Click there and you'll see all of the different partners we have, how you can apply. Um, you do have to be, I believe, 60% through your program, uh, AGS or ASFT, so the degree program or the advanced gun uh, certificate program. Those are the only two that are eligible for that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later, I'm sure, um, as far as, as Gabe's go, uh, goes. But for now, if you'd like any additional information, you know where to find us. Um, feel free to reach out to admissions at sdi.edu for information on the programs and courses as well. So. Um, Let's get into some of the good stuff here. First of all, um, Gabe, thank you so much for being here tonight. If you can't tell, I'm geeked up about this. <laughs> so um, just what we talked about earlier today, I think all of the guys on the line are really going to get a, a, you know, a lot of good information out of. So um, first and foremost, thank you. We really do appreciate your time. Um, yeah, and yeah, I, 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 I think this is going to be really, really good tonight. So um, what I'd like to do is dive in and have you tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about, uh, as you can see here, I, I put some of these bullet points kind of in order so that we can um, transition into the north side gun shop stuff specifically, which will then get us into the topics for tonight. So tell us a little bit about where you came from and how everything got started. Sure. Well, um, so it all started in 1978. <laughs> Maybe not that far. <laughs> okay. We'll skip, we'll skip forward a little bit. Um, I, uh, I started out with the Marine Corps, um, and after I got out of the Marine Corps, took a little time away from the military, then went into the Army National Guard, and then an the opportunity came up to do the Air Force for a year on a contract deal. And then uh, that's kind of where – when I was doing the army thing is when I got into weapons. When I got into the army thing, I was doing the weapons and, um, I, uh, I kind of got more involved in, in the day to days with, uh, the armors themselves and trying to figure out, you know, um, how to repair and, and fix and maintain the weapons and crew serve weapons was a big thing, but obviously we can't have them out here. Um, but, uh, I got really involved with the AR 15 and, um, learned everything I could about it. And then, uh, Got out, started my own business, um, hauling custom motorcycles all over the country for people, and it brought me to Tennessee, and uh, that's where I met uh, Zeke, and uh, he brought me into SDI as a liaison, and I got more hands-on um, with the process of gunsmithing, and it kind of just ultimately catapulted me to, uh, you know, owning my own gun shop. Um, and I've been with Northside since officially 2013, since it opened. And then in between there, I was liaisoning for SDI. Awesome. Um, talk to me about, um, I guess, from, from the beginning, uh, how did you kind of get your fingers in Northside Gun Shop? How did you decide on that location? You know what I mean? How, take me from the beginning of that iteration, um, and let's walk through some of that a little bit. Yeah. Um, that was kind of an interesting opportunity. Uh, I happened by the gun store one day and I knocked on the door and he wasn't open yet. And um, I'm open for business yet. He was just putting the store together and I asked him if he needed any help. And uh, we sat and talked for a minute and told him my background and um, I offered him, you know, the opportunity to basically, you know, have an employee right off the bat that had some, you know, interest and knowledge in firearms. And uh, I started working for him. Then uh, I started general managing for him, and ultimately I was running the store, and he was kind of just off doing his own thing and checking in. And uh, it went on like that, and then I took, you know, a more um, active uh, stance with SDI, and I was out doing a lot more of that. So I kind of backed away from the gun store, and he came back. Um, one day I was, I think it was, uh, I can't remember when it was. It was after one of the last events I did. I had the opportunity to purchase the store from him. He came to me and said he was looking to get out of the business and uh, offered the store to me. And he had dwindled the inventory down to next to nothing because he was just going to sell it all off and close. 
and uh, I, I went ahead and just kind of jumped right into it and took it over and started making it my own. Awesome. Um, so let's focus mostly tonight on September 2015 and on, um, okay. you know, when you made that purchase. Um, I've got a bunch of questions in here, here already, but I'd like to kind of explore that process a little bit um, when it came to the changing of the ownership hands um, and, it, you know, kind of paperwork involved, what the vetting process looked like for you. Can you speak on that at all? Yeah, so even though we changed hands, I mean, I bought a, at a gun store. All I really bought was uh, the customer base that he had and a little bit of inventory. Uh, everything else starts the exact same way if you start from scratch. So what I mean by that is you have to get your FFL. I chose to get my FFL 07 for manufacturing uh, so that I could do custom ARs and custom 1911s, which is what we're working on right now. We've got a, a custom gun we're building. Um, the ARs, that's pretty simplistic as far as doing the customization work on those. Um, and all I mean by building custom ARs is starting with a serialized receiver and building from there. By law, you have to have a manufacturer's license to do that work. There are go-betweens and ways around it, but it's frowned upon by the ATF. So I had to get all my paperwork in line just to get that process. Now, the paperwork process took officially uh, three months from start to finish from the time I submitted it to the time I got my ATF interview, to the time I received my license. So I had the opportunity to run underneath his license, technically as the, the manager of the store, until my paperwork came through. Um, if you guys are taking notes at all, there's a couple things I'm going to have you write down. So uh, grab your paper and pen, because you're going to want to know this stuff. Um, there's a company called Clover, if you're not familiar with them. They're a processing company. They offer the lowest rate possible. It's one point four percent processing fees and it's a uh, it's basically uh, a scanning station you've got credit card you've got a you know screen it's got a go app where you can take your phone if you're going to go out and do gun shows or do work anywhere else um, the other one that you're going to want to do is a company called gun store master gun store master is an electronic bound book the gun store master costs roughly um, I think it's $99 a month or maybe $49 a month. It's $49 a month. And it maintains all of your paperwork, your transfer paperwork, your 4473s electronically. Also keeps all of your inventory in check. So you don't have to run a paper log, which is a huge, huge waste of time with the technology that's available. Um, the other thing I had to do was establish contact with different distributors. Some of the major distributors that you can get a hold of that that are easy to work with for new companies is Sport South LLC, Chattanooga Shooting Supply, RSR Group, Bill Hicks and Company, Lipsy's, Davidson's, Tactical Gear, Tactical Gear Distributors, and uh, a new company called Orion, which allows you to get into Kimber and um, CZs without having to buy in the $25,000 that it actually takes to get into those companies to purchase their products. So wanna, basically, yeah, sorry to cut in. I want to expand a little bit on that. Um, before we do, though, I had a couple questions. You were talking a little bit about uh, when you were getting started up, you know, you got your FFL all of that good stuff. Um, quite a, a couple people asked, did you register with ITAR? No. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, I know that you and I talked earlier about almost how you've set up your business model. Um, and I know you just listed off a, a bunch of resources and I can tell everybody's writing them down because I got no questions during that entire time, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, Oh yeah. Okay. So Andrew's asking for a list of those names. Let me. I'll get with Gabe. You and I can um, get together offline. I'll take a little uh, list for you and everything, and then I'll, I'll keep them to the side. Anybody who wants that list, um, go ahead and email me, Jennifer at sdi.edu, um, and I will. Uh, I'll take notes from Gabe and I'll get them out to you if you want them. Um, yeah. A, a, a couple people are interested in that list, so that's great. Perfect. Okay. okay. 
Um, and there, and yes, guys, uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning, this is being recorded. We will post it to the YouTube channel probably tomorrow, and then we're going to share the link on Facebook, so keep an eye out. Okay, um, back to your business model. I want to delve into that uh, in a little bit deeper detail um, and kind of talk about the distributor and online side of things and all that good stuff. Can you walk okay. me through some of that? Yeah, um, so there's an option that you can do. Like, I'm a small store. Um, I do a, a lot of volume. It's because of the way that I do my business. So one thing that's been really successful for us here from the time I took it, and I don't mind telling you guys numbers just so you can kind of get an idea. Um, basically, I did a $20,000 investment into inventory. Um, the inventory that was here, there was maybe maybe $10,000 worth of ammunition and um, the guns, the way I did it, just because it worked out that way, is as I sold his guns off, I gave him uh, that money in a return and uh, just banked the profit. So I kind of, I had a few guns. It wasn't a lot, but I did a $20,000 buy-in. Um, hold on a second. I got a Harley outside going off. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> we all ride around here, so it's not too far-fetched to have a Harley show up every once in a while. Um, yep, I believe it. So um, basically the, the way that I did the business module, uh, the model itself is I turned this place into a barbershop, like not literally, but it's like an old school barbershop where people can come hang out, do their thing all day. Um, There's some pictures here. I'm going to post up for you here. It's, it's a really simplistic store. So basically I set things up with distributors. And that's really simple. All they want is your FFL, uh, your bank information, and, you know, a phone number. And we mostly, um, I work everything on cash. That's one thing I'll tell you I can recommend to people is you may think you need a ton of inventory right away, um, but people know new businesses start small. Don't put yourself on a line of credit. Everything I have in this store is bought and paid for now. And I grew the store from when I took it it was doing roughly maybe sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year and in three months I took it to two hundred and fifty six thousand dollars so the first three months I was in business I took the store from eighty to two hundred and fifty because of the way I decided to do it and it was a risk but it was actually a better way and I'm free and clear so you don't have to buy into the hey we'll give you you know a net thirty which is where you can have whatever you want but then you have to pay us in thirty days every distributor has a cash purchase option and most of the time to get the free shipping from them you only have to meet the five hundred to fifteen hundred dollar mark on an order so what I do a lot of is custom orders for people I carry a basic inventory I carry the Glock the Smith & Wesson the CZ's the Sig Sauer's very very minimal just a few of each category and then if they want something else your distributor gets it to you overnight because it comes from either Louisiana Ohio, uh, Tennessee, um, there's one out in Colorado, there's a few other distributors. So you've got distributors that are located pretty well throughout the, the states. Texas has one. Um, so you don't have to, like I'm saying, you don't have to go in with a big massive inventory to get started. You can start small and just have those things overnighted to your customers. And if you have the good customer service, your customers don't mind waiting a day. They don't mind waiting two days for a product. Yeah, and I've got I've got these uh, pictures up here, and I want to talk a little bit about um, you know you, you said you've made it like a barber shop. Tell me about how that culture plays into your daily life. You know what I mean as a shop. Um, right. what, what does that look like for you? Um, I mean, basically, it's it's a hangout. So I'm I'm a vet. Um, you know, there's a lot of veterans. Pretty much everywhere you go, you can't avoid us. But the one thing that veterans like to do is get together and hang out in a no pressure environment. Um, so this has really become anywhere in middle Tennessee. If there's a vet that's heard about us, they come all the way from Clarksville, which is an hour and a half north, all the way down to, you know, into Huntsville, Alabama, which is an hour south, uh, and then east and west in the same direction. But we've basically turned it into a, a no pressure environment. It's kind of like, uh, you know, they can come in, anybody can come in, not just veterans, but my customers can come in, 
They look around. I don't pressure sale anybody. Um, I treat every man, woman, you know, uh, the same as if they were my sister, my mother, my father, or my brother. It's a personalized service. Um, I try to remember all of them by name. It's very difficult to do that. Um, but the more personal your service is and the nicer you are to people and that you treat people the way that you'd want to be treated, your business flourishes. You don't have to worry about making, you know, that high pressure sale. Cause I'll be honest, there's not a lot of money in selling a gun. Your business, your money is coming from the return purchases on your accessories and your ammunition. You're going to sell a Glock and you're going to make, you know, to be competitive, you're going to make 50 to 60 bucks to sell a Glock. That's nothing when they're going to come in and drop $200 on a case of ammo or $300 on a case of ammo where your return is 30 to 40%. You're going to make more there. So what we did is created a, a culture where people can come and hang out. And I also do events. So we do one every year called Guns and Guitars where we have uh, you know, famous songwriters and musicians that will come down from Nashville. We have a big barbecue. We open up the back door. People hang out, we play music, we run specials, and we do a bunch of, you know, a bunch of giveaways and raise money for charities. So really my advertising structure, like we talked about earlier, is event-based and it's word of mouth. Um, except when I stir up controversy with Fox News and uh the NRA. Then I... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um Okay, so I've got a ton of good questions coming in. Uh okay. Let me, first of all, how far from Nashville is the, sh is the shop, Tommy would like to I, know? I am literally 34 minutes south of Nashville off of I-65 and Saturn in, Parkway. In Columbia, am I getting that right? Yeah, it's it's the border of Spring Hill and Columbia. It's literally right okay. on the line. Okay, cool. Um, we've got a couple questions about, um, well, first of all, since this could be a quick little one-off, did you use any VA benefits for your startup? Anything like that? No. Um, this happened so quickly that, I mean, it, it went down like this. It was a Friday. He said, do you want to buy the shop? I went home, and Monday morning I took over. So yeah. there was no time for me to get involved and use the VA at all. Um, I, I am now that I'm, you know, five, six months into it, I'm starting to uh, explore options. But, again, I didn't want to take any kind of a loan at all. Right. Um, I didn't want to have to do that at all. I didn't want to be in debt to anyone. Um, I was fortunate to have a little bit of money saved away from the music business. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just that 20 grand that kind of helped me launch. Now, if right. I was going to do a loan, I wouldn't do any more than 20 to 30 grand just to get started to get a small inventory in. Right. But I will be using my VA stuff fairly soon. I just haven't climbed down that road as far as to register with as a, you know, um, a service disabled veteran business or anything like that. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. A um, couple guys are asking about employees. Do you have any? How do you decide who to hire? What do you pay them? A couple of questions regarding that. Can you walk me through that size? That uh, size well, things? yeah, in this area, um, you know, a fair wage would be $100 a day for somebody who's working in a gun store, mm -hmm. uh, especially when they get to hang out, play with guns, and shoot pool most of the day. <laughs> Not so, a bad setup, huh? <laughs> I've got a refrigerator and we've got, you know, soda and water and yeah, like I said, it's pretty much just kind of big, like a big clubhouse in a way, if, if you will. But right. um, as far as employees go, um, I have different uh, service connected veterans that come through here, you know, like disabled veterans um, that are local and they come in and they do um, kind of like externship stuff. I mean, I can't, legally pay them as an employee so they come in and they help out and they they'll get discounts or sometimes I you know I'll set them up with a, a firearm if they need a firearm and they can work it off kind of deal so right sure. now I only I really only hire veterans and this kind of the whole purpose of this this business was to make it a place to benefit the other veterans in this community so we do a lot of right. veteran outreach programs we work with like I'm part of the CVMA the Combat Vets Motorcycle Association um, and so we sell our Northside Gun Shop shirts in here with our Stop 22 logos on them, and I donate money back from every shirt to local veterans that are, you know, in distress and their families. We help them out. So really, it's a it's a veteran-based operation. Everybody that works through here that helps me out, they're all veterans. Okay, cool. And along those same lines, 
Um, Hansen wants to know if it's a good idea to offer exclusive deals and pricing for specific client types like military, law enforcement, first responders, stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that one of the things that you get, that's a great question. One of the things that you get through your distributors is Smith and Wesson offers the blue program, the blue label program. So for your law enforcement and your active duty military, and I think there's still some programs out there for fire and EMS, but they offer those discounts already. So uh, a cop can come in and purchase a Smith and Wesson shield nine millimeter for roughly $325. Right now it's not a great deal because they're doing a big promotion with their big rebate, but ordinarily that's a great deal. Usually they offer a hundred dollar discount to law enforcement, which if you connect with your local law enforcement, that's a huge traffic driver. Um, on the other side, I offer 10% discounts um, on ammunition accessories to military and on firearms, depending on the cost of the firearm, I have a scale that I use to gauge the discount for military as well. So say the gun costs me $440. We'll just take a, a Gen 3 Glock 19, $440 is cost, and that gun's gonna sell for $499. Well, there's not a lot of markup there anyway. So I will do $25 over cost to someone in the military that can you know, show me a DD-214 or a military ID. And I just scale it. So if it's a more expensive gun and it has an MSRP, then I will sell it at the lowest possible price that I can sell it by the manufacturer You know, if, if they offer one, if they have their the lowest price like uh, SIG does that a lot. Um, but discounts are huge. It's gonna help your business. It's also gonna be word of mouth. It's gonna tell people that you're in the you're in more than just the making money business, you're in the people business, and that's what I try to be in. Absolutely. Um, we've got a couple people, uh, just a quick follow up on employees. Um, are there any specific positions a shop should consider, like a must have, a stalker or a cashier, um, something along those lines? Yeah, I mean, it's marketing in itself. So, one of the big things that you want to find is somebody that, you know, whether, you know, you choose to hire you know, like I do where I'm trying to function as a military business is to hire military. You have to make sure that they have a good personality. That's a huge thing. And that person is going to be your counter person and your salesman. Um, and they don't have to be a salesman. You know, when you think of a salesman, a lot of us kind of cringe. They just sure. have to be personable. You know, if it's somebody that, that you know or somebody that you can bring in who can talk to anyone, who can have a conversation about everything, that can be non-argumentative, um, that's a great counter person. You'll want to take control of your bound book exclusively because ultimately the person that goes to jail and loses their license is you. So right. in my shop, I'm the only one that logs in guns and logs them out. There's one other person that I have that does that with me, but we do it side by side when we do it and he's logging in and I'm logging out. Um, so the, that's the only time I've ever had anybody really do it for me. I made the mistake early on of, of trying to, you know, show people how to do it. And then it just got confused and I had to go back through and make adjustments in the bound book. And it makes you look really bad to the ATF if you can't keep your paperwork straight. Sure. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Correct. Yeah. So basically um, you'll need like a basic shop person, you know, someone yeah. who can clean, take out trashes, help customers. That's like the lowest level. And then you'll want a counter person, someone you can trust with a great personality that can sell guns and collect money that you're not going to have to worry about stealing from you. And then if you're in the position to do it, you know, um, you can have a general manager. That way you can just worry about your ordering, uh, special orders, and your paperwork. Because there is about three hours of paperwork, whether you do it during the day or at the end of the day, there's at least three hours of paperwork a day. And um, and that's, that's going to be all on you. You don't want anybody else doing that. Right. Um, I'm going to use this next question as kind of a segue into more, uh, uh, just a couple extra gunsmithing questions. Um, Ronald would like to know, do you have a comparison of profit between gunsmithing services and merchandise sales? Does one rely on the other? How does that break down? That kind of thing. So I do general maintenance and repair work, which is, you know, what SDI teaches is the, the basic, you know, the entry level non-machining, yeah. Um, I do all of that. So if somebody brings in whatever they bring in, I have a scale. Basically, if um, you know somebody brings me in a trigger job, 
they want a trigger job done, you know, or they want a drop in trigger done to a Glock or they want any of that. I charge a set rate. Now there's no, there's no real way to gauge which one relies on the other. They just kind of go hand in hand. So um, it kind of fluctuates, you know, one week I might get 10 jobs and those 10 jobs are going to pay me anywhere from 80 to $125 a piece. Or I may not get any jobs, but this week now my accessories and my ammunition sales are up. I don't rely on the gunsmithing. The gunsmithing is a bonus because I'm in the retail business more than I am the gunsmithing business. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. But it is. Um, a, I do. It's a go great ahead, benefit. Sorry. Yeah, it's a great add-on because every gun store you'll ever go into is going to have that old guy that walks in with that 1927, you know. Uh, shotgun and says hey can you fix this and you got to know how to do it I mean that's one right. of the, the great things about having SDI absolutely um, I've got a couple little business gunsmithy type of questions um, how do you price out a repair job without knowing exactly how much time you're gonna be spending on the repair any tips um, I price it on the amount of pain I feel like I'm gonna go through <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, certain things are simple. You know, if they buy, I, I do a lot of stuff for my customers. So say they buy a gun from me and they buy a set of sights they want to have them put on. I do it for free. I don't charge for that. That's the kind of business that keeps people coming back anyway. So that, that more personalized service. And I know a lot of people have told me like, man, that's crazy. You could get, you know, $30, $40 to do the sights, but they're already buying the sights from me and they bought the gun from me. So to me, it's just, it takes five minutes to put a set of sights on and line them up. Um, I base everything really off of um, individual task. So I'll judge it. If it's, it looks like it's going to take me an hour, hour and a half, you know, I'm in the 80 to a hundred dollar range. Um, but if it's a job, you know, I have a lot of stuff that I'll, I'll do outsourcing. I have a Cerakoter. So if somebody wants a Cerakote job, then I basically link up with the local Cerakoter. Um, and I say, Hey man, here's what's your price point for me. And then I do a markup on those items. I ship them out. I call the customer when they come back. I collect my side. So there's a lot of ways that you can, you know, do that. If you can get with a local gunsmith, which I'm actually getting ready to do. He's a full-blown gunsmith uh, with machines and everything. I'm going to partner with him. And what I'm going to do with him is basically I'm going to take the stuff in. I'm going to price the job. He's going to take them, repair them, bring them back to me. And I'm just going to collect on the process. I'm not even going to have to do the repairs unless it's something I really want to do in the store. But you can figure $80 to $100 an hour. Um, but the more hours you spend, the less they want to pay. So you've got to try to get that job within a two-hour period and be around $150 to $175 max. And if it's just an old gun and there's not much you can do, I explain them like, hey, look, this gun's worth about $250, $300, bucks, and I'm going to spend $150 to repair it for you. We may just want to clean it up and make it a wall hanger. Sure. Um, so you typically price per project, not per hour. Is that right? Yeah, I don't do anything by the hour. Um, and, and that's just because I don't, I don't want to, it's kind of like, you know, construction. I don't want to underprice or overprice. So I'll look at right. the job and decide how much time I'm going to put into it and how much I'm willing to take for the job. And I charge that way. And I have set things, like I said, sites is a set deal on, a, you know, on pistols. Um, knocking gas blocks, front sight post gas blocks off ARs and replacing, you know, um, low pro gas blocks and gas tubes. Those are all set pricing. But when it comes to time invested, I judge per job. Okay, cool. Um, same type of topic, general gunsmithing. What are the top three jobs you typically see on a consistent basis, would you say? Um, sights on pistols. AR-15 upgrades and modifications, and uh, people that disassemble shotguns and can't put them back together. <laughs> nice. <laughs> those, those are the three that I get. When I get, I get people that come in here with a box of shotgun parts, and they go, I, I don't know what I did. I can't get it back yeah. together. <laughs> nice. <laughs> your, money, your money makers are putting sights on and customizing ARs, and I actually do it integratively. So I sit there with the customer and I teach them how to do what I'm doing. You know, I'm basically giving right. them a building class while I'm doing it with them. Cause it takes me roughly 
25 to 30 minutes to start from a box of AR parts to build a complete gun, no matter what I'm doing to it. Right. So it doesn't take me much more time to sit there and kind of teach them how to do it along the way. Okay. Now, now I have a question here that um, that'll be interesting, I think, especially because of your uh, kind of unique, very person-oriented business model here. Um, James wants to know, how do you balance out the barstool regulars versus the real buying customers, you know, in different times of the year that are busy and slow? How, you know, what, what's your game plan there as a business owner? You're talking about the guys that just hang out versus the, the quick hitters? The guys yeah, and, in and I'm oh. interested to see what you say because of the way that you run your shop. You know what I mean? Because you exhibit this culture in your shop. Well, that's the thing is um, – the guys that it, it, this is kind of funny how it happened. Um, the guys that come in here, they hang around so much. They learn the gun business. They actually stand up and help customers when I'm busy. So my my barstool guys, my you know my local guys that hang around a lot, mm -hmm. they'll come in here just to hang out and they'll end up selling guns for me. So yeah, cool. I've built the relationship with you know the community here to that level where. I mean, they're happy to hang out, and while they're hanging out, they'll talk to people about guns because they have knowledge and they shoot a lot. And, um, you know, the individual customer that comes in, here's the biggest thing. This is one thing I definitely do. Oh, there's my logo that started all the controversy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so really there's a backstory on all that for everybody. I'll get off topic. I, uh, I tried to sponsor a Lions Club baseball team, and they took my, took my money, and then they came in a week later and asked me to change that logo. There's an AR in the state of Tennessee, if you can't tell. And uh, I said no and called Fox News and ended up on their show and then ended up on the NRA because I took a stand against <laughs> the liberal ideology that's plaguing us. Right. Um, anyway, so uh, see, I got off topic now. I know. I can't remember what we were talking about. Uh, the guys that sell, the, you know, your barstool regulars. Yeah. Those guys end up, you know, if you treat the people right and, and treat your customers right and, you know, let those guys come in and hang out and talk to them, you know, periodically throughout the day, just ask them how things are going. They become, uh, you know, free free workers in a way. But sure. I also give those guys discounts. Like there's two customers that I have that buy guns from me. I mean, I would say weekly. And what I've done for those guys is I've yeah. offered them the opportunity to buy one gun every quarter at cost plus tax and background. So that's just like, you know, a way of, of giving them an appreciation for what they've done, you know, right. and also drive a ton of business here. So your barstool guys, your regulars, your hangarounds, they're going to drive a ton of business here anyway. So um, I basically just let them do whatever they want to do. If they want to hang out for four hours and play pool. No problem. You know, I'm happy. To <laughs> right. It's not costing so, anything. <laughs> and your other customers, and that's the thing is your your hangarounds, they don't they don't get offended if you're like, hey man, I gotta go talk to this customer real quick. Because that's what they're doing. They're just there to hang out anyway. Yeah. So yeah. There, there's really the balance is pretty simple um as far as is having to regulate between the two. Um, you know, they're they know that the paying customers that are in there get the, the priority and they're sure. more than happy to stand up and help. Sure. Um, do you have a range on site? I used to, but they built a bunch of houses behind me. Um, oh, bummer. Okay. I used to just kick the back door open and shoot out into the berm out there. <laughs> the county was literally 500 feet behind me. So, um, the, the, you know, the, uh, I could walk like 500 feet out the back door and I'd be down into a ditch with a berm and I'd go out there and test fire. Uh, but there is a range that's local, and here's what you do is you partner with that local range, and um, you you do a deal with them and say, hey, if anybody buys a gun here, you know, would you be willing to give them a free range day to come check out your range? And they'll cross-promote you. That's what I did. So right. they send people to me all the time. I also partnered with my local NRA um, concealed carry instructor, and uh, – he cross promotes me all the time as well. So really it's about politicking, um, you know, going out into the community, finding those other people in the industry that are the same, you know, business mind as you and, and creating a super group and feeding each other customers. 
I want to get into that more, um, but I have one question before that. Actually, I lied. I have two questions before that. I've got a couple guys that want one of your T-shirts. How do, is there a way to buy them online? <laughs> um, yeah, you can actually you can call the store, and I mean that's I'll answer the phone most likely. If I'm not going to answer, somebody else does. But um, we can sell you one over the over the phone and just ship it to your house. Um, but I do have my website that just went up, and we can get into that thing too as well. Perfect. Can... That's exactly what I was going to ask next. So well, I, I figured. Yeah. I figured. I I've been getting really good at reading minds lately. This is my new thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's a good you know little thing to have on the resume. Um, yeah, a ton of guys are asking about. Do you have a website? Do you outsource that stuff as far as uh, yeah. social media, YouTube, digital marketing? What do you do on that side of the house? Right. So um, I uh, I have a company that I use called Gearfire. And if you look at my website, it looks a lot like everybody else's website because everybody uses Gearfire. Gearfire is a company that you pay roughly $100 a month to. Uh, you can buy area codes in your area for $50 a piece. So any of the SEO traffic, any of the Google traffic that comes through and people are searching for a gun store, you can buy a zip code. I bought the two zip codes that surround my store. So I pay $200 a month now. Um, and this is a drop and go website. You literally have an agent that you talk to um, and they're out in Scottsdale, Arizona. And uh, you talk to them and your store is loaded with everything that your distributors have live 24 seven. So you are basically opening your own drop ship with the capabilities of adding specific products. Like if you go to my website, which is northsidegunshop.com, you'll see our 22 hats, which is what we sell for the CVMA. I load those on there. Any orders that come through, I ship those myself. But if somebody buys accessories or ammunition, it is drop shipped from the warehouse. I never touch it, and all I see is the residuals. Um, that's a that's a great opportunity. Like I said, it's called Gear Fire, and um, that is huge. I I launched our site three weeks ago. The first week we didn't do anything, and so far in the last two weeks I've done a thousand dollars a week in stuff I've never even seen. So it's kind of cool, and that. Yeah. This is really neat, and I'd like to expand on it a little bit because those of you who have um, been with us for webinars with Kip and um, some of the other business owners that we have, this is a completely different model. So um, for those of you thinking of opening, pay close attention to this. Um, it, it may be something to, to definitely check out. You know, it may work out for you nicely. Um, how does that work? You know, how, how do you pick your distributors? How do you, right. uh, you know what I mean? How, what, what's the thought process there? Here's here's the way I went backwards because I already had the store and then I launched into Gearfire. But if somebody right. wanted, and I've thought about this a lot, um, and maybe I would have done it different or maybe not because I actually like getting out of my house and being here at the store a lot. Sure, uh, sure. But if you wanted to, you could literally start a gun shop with no money other than paying for your startup costs for ATF and launching into Gearfire. You could build a website um, with Gearfire, which literally takes five minutes. All you have to do is get your, your distribution set up and tell them which distributors you have, and then they automatically plug in all the inventory for you. You literally don't have to touch it. You don't have to know how to do it, nothing. Um, so what I would have done originally was I would have called Gearfire and said, hey, I'd like to open an online store. What distributors do you work with? And then they will tell you the companies that they currently house. And then I would go to those distributors and say, hey, I want an account. And I would start an online store only. And I would bottom dollar those prices to the point where you're competing with Bud's Gun Shop and Kentucky Gun Company and all those other companies. And, yeah, you're only making 5 to $10 on a gun sale sometimes, but you never touch it. So... I mean, you can just think, if you can think kind of globally on that, it's a website that carries products that you never have to mess with. The only time you'll ever touch a gun is if somebody orders a gun and has it sent to your FFL location for a transfer. And that's it. Otherwise, you never see it because it gets drop shipped from the location at the warehouse to whatever gun store they choose wherever they live. And it takes all of the work out of a day-to-day -day operation. What that would allow you to do 
is to go and do the gun show circuit on the weekends and sell specialized products like AR parts are huge always. Um, anything Glock that you can get your hands on is great. Your accessories are going to make a ton more money than your gun sales anyway. So you could have all of that online, never see it, just collect that mailbox money every month and then have stuff to take to do gun shows and just basically work on the weekends as much as you want. Chris wants to know how the drop shipping works. Do you know much about that side? Yeah, so if you go on my website right now and you order, um, well, it's okay, just pretend it's Amazon. It's the same process. Amazon is a massive drop ship company. Now they'd have their own warehouses now, but back in the day when they started, the other companies would ship for them. So GearFire works the same way. If I buy a product off of my website and I want it sent to my house, GearFire then puts the purchase order in for that product. The distribution company that actually warehouses that product ships that product directly to my house or whatever address I specified in my order. So it works just like Amazon. I mean, it's, it's pretty much the same model. Okay. Um, how difficult is it to get distributors? Um, it's, it's really not at all. They don't, um, some of them run a, a credit check. Um, most of them, you know, with the market the way the market is now, and it's, I mean, it's great that we have, you know, a president in office who's pro-gun, but that also took a hit to the gun market. So with the market the way it is right now, um, distributors are fine with taking on anybody and everybody, and they don't necessarily do credit and background checks um, as far as to make sure your personal finances are in order. All you got to do is fill out the paperwork, submit your FFL, turn in a copy of your driver's license, and provide your bank information, and do a COD. That's the key right there. If you go in there with a credit app, you're going to get kicked. I guarantee it because they want two years of solid business before they're going to give you credit. But if you go in and you're saying, hey, I'll pay, you know, I'll do a COD. So every time you get your guns from them, you write a check to Mr. UPS man, and he sends it in. That's all they care about is getting their money. So it's not a hard process at all if you do everything in, in cash on, on the spot. Okay. Um, there's a question here from Michael, and, and Michael, chime in on the notes section if I'm getting this wrong. He says for GearFire, um, is the distributor provider the provider of the FFL? Uh, okay. Give me some details on Michael on that, Michael. It says for GearFire, is distributor provider of FFL to transferring FFL or you? Um, right. I understand what he's saying. So okay. there's two ways that it works. There's an option that you can choose, and it's a drop ship. So they'll go in, they'll purchase the firearm, they'll choose what what company they want to ship it to. Now, the way that the chain of custody works on the gun is wherever that gun comes from, that is the transferring dealer. So if it's ordered and it ships from Sports South Warehouse in Shreveport, Louisiana, when it gets to the next FFL where the customer goes to pick it up, it's coming from Shreveport, Louisiana's FFL to on-site to the other gun store. So my FFL is technically never involved in that. All I'm doing at this point is acting like a broker in a way. But the other thing that happens is if you want to, you can choose the option to have it shipped to your store so you can get hands on it, do personalized packaging for your customer, and then ship it out. So there's two ways to do it with, with GearFire. Okay, perfect. Um, a couple people have asked about insurance. Uh, anything? What do you have? What do you recommend? That type of thing. Um, yeah, I use, uh, I have farmers business insurance, um, and I have a million dollar policy on liability and I have a, a, a policy that covers my inventory as well. Um, as far as like the financials on all that, um, I'm pretty fortunate to have a wife who does all of my books and has a degree in business. So I get to just kind of be the front man and she has to deal with all the uh, the financial stuff. It's not much. I think the policy was like 500 a year uh, for the liability. And that just covers in case, you know, for whatever reason, somebody shoots himself in your store. Sure. Um, or you, or any kind of negligent right. distance. That's, <laughs> right. not my wife. that's not my wife. That's actually oh, yeah, a girl that's that, bad timing. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's a girl that won a gun. Um, I did a raffle on Facebook 
uh, at Christmas time, and I gave away a rifle, and she was actually the one that won it. She happened to be an hour away, and she drove in. And then, of course, it went. You know, everybody thought it was a fix, and you know, it. But it just caused more caused more views to my website and more views yeah. to to Northside. And that's the thing is, it, honestly, in this business, there's no bad press. So unless unless you're known as you know a, a bad person, that's bad right. press. But just for your store to get controversy, it's actually kind of a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, we've had a couple guys ask about uh, almost peripheral parts of your business. Is there, Nathan wants to know if there's any benefit to offering training programs like hunter safety, concealed carry, all that good stuff. You know, there, there is, but if I, could, if I could bring you in here for one day and show you the amount of time it takes just to manage the retail side of this business, um, yeah. you wouldn't want to do anything else. And that's why I outsourced. I went to those other people that have already spent their time building those businesses, and I said, hey, if I send you customers, how about you give me X amount per customer, and if you send me customers, you know, um, you know, then it's just a wash, basically. So if you go and outsource that stuff, rather than try to bring it in-house, it's going to be a lot easier to manage right off the bat. Now, would I love to have a big facility with a bunch of employees where I could actually have all that in-house? Yeah, but that's going to require a range. And the minimum amount that you're going to build a small range for in this state is roughly $4 million. Um, you need really about $150 million to build a, a, a really great range. It costs $250,000 per lane is about what it costs to build a range right now. So you've okay. got to have a ton of change. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, you know, you keep talking about uh, cross promotion and things like that, and that's something I want you to hit a little bit um, deeper because I feel like you're kind of king of cross promotion. You know what I mean? <laughs> this is a this is a major major um, deviation from some of the guests we've had on in the past who tend to go more traditional route. Um, so let's talk about from a marketing perspective. You know, we had a, a question early on in the evening that was like, wait a second, how did you take it from, you know, 80,000 to 250,000? You know, there are a couple people that are, that are like, how, did, how does this happen? And I think a lot of it has to do with this, this delegation, essentially, this cross-promotion model that right. you use. Can you talk about that a little more? Yeah, and I, I know that we're running up on the 8 o'clock hour. I'm here. I'm, I'm fine to stay as long as people have questions or they want to talk and, until you're tired. Um, okay, cool. But I'm good for a while longer if people have more questions because this is, I mean, realistically, this is, I, I didn't know anything about this. This is my first venture into retail, and I've learned so much so quickly that I would, uh, I'm more than happy to pass it on so we can stay here as long as we need to. Okay, um, great. So, that right there is a prime example of how I cross promote. It's a segue. Um, but basically, I know no boundaries when it comes to talking to people. Every chance that I get to tell people about me and tell people what I'm about and what I stand for and the type of service and product that I offer, I do. I look for every single opportunity and every conversation. Not to say, hey, look at me, but to say, hey, how can I help you? Here's what I do. And I make those simple connections, and I have a Rolodex in my head. So when I'm in other conversations, I'm remembering those people that I've talked to before, and I make those connections like, hey, you need to meet so-and-so. They're involved in this. And those two get to talking. And then you know, they start a, a relationship, and then that relationship still involves me because I'm the one that brought them together. So when they're talking to other people, they're remembering, hey, that you know that guy did me a solid, and you need to go check him out because he's got this gun shop. And really, it's about networking. That's that's all this is from a marketing perspective is is networking. Um, it's nonstop, you know, uh, product placement and branding. So I'm constantly out there doing stuff. I work with every charity that I could possibly work for that run, runs through that door. And I don't mean giving away stuff. Um, I do that. Occasionally, I give guns away. Um, but I offer them guns at cost for their raffle. So all they have to do is pre-sell the tickets. And when they get enough money to purchase the firearm, then they come down, they pay for the firearm. Like the gas station down here just raised money for Vanderbilt Children's Center. 
she sold 250 tickets at $20 a piece for a Glock 19. I'm sorry, Glock 17. So it didn't take her long to get to that cost price on a Glock 17 Gen 4, which is $560 roughly, um, mm -hmm. or $460. And then she's got all that excess. So I look for every opportunity that I can to insert myself into community events, every opportunity to insert myself into people's personal lives if they need help, veterans especially. Um, I write checks. You know, uh, I'm not a pawn shop, but I do... Um, I do a loan every once in a while to a veteran who needs something. They'll bring a gun down here and they'll want to sell it to me. And, you know, it breaks my heart to see them have to sell stuff that they really care about. So I'll cut them a check and I'll just say, hey, give me back when you can. I'll hold the gun for a few months for you. It's no big deal. Will I ever sell the gun? No. If it takes a guy six months to a year to pay me back for 600 bucks, it's fine. Because that little thing right there may seem simplistic, you know, to to us, but it could mean everything to him, you know, or her. So I try to do, I don't even really know how to explain it. It's just, I guess it's just the way I was raised um, is I try to, I try to put myself into things a hundred percent, no matter what I do, where I go. And I cross promote everywhere. If there's an opportunity for me to be involved in something I'm in. Absolutely. Um, I think that answered most of the questions that you guys had um, posed about that side of things. If you have a follow-up question, though, feel free to chime in. I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce around a little bit here. Um, oh, we've got a, yeah, go ahead. Also, um, and I know there's 134 people on here. 33, one dropped off. Um, yeah. <laughs> so they don't get to hear this opportunity. Um, but if you're in the Tennessee area and you want to come down and hang out here for a day or you're Alabama or whatever, you want to make the trip here for a day. And, you know, it doesn't have to be part of the whole, you know, uh, externship. If you just want to come spend a day down here and see what's going on, just kind of get your head around it. That's fine. If you want to come down here for the field study program, you know, get with SDI and I'd love to have you down here for a little bit. Mm -hmm. But if you want to pop in and just check it out and see what's going on here, that's great too. Um, if you have questions, you know, um, send me an email and I'll do my best to get back to you on them or send Jennifer an email, I guess, and I'll do my best to answer some questions that we don't cover. Yep, absolutely. And it looks like a couple of people are interested in that field study. So for those of you who have chimed in and said that you might be interested in that, um, certainly Anna Moody at field study uh, at sdi.edu. So field study at sdi.edu. Um, You'll get to Anna Moody. She's in charge of it all. Uh, she'll be able to answer any questions you have, walk you through the application process, um, kind of let you know, you know, based on where you are in the program, when she thinks the right time to apply for that type of thing would be. Um, so certainly reach out to her, and she'd be more than happy to help you with that whole thing. So, um, okay, uh, let's do this. So, in your opinion, or or from what you understand, um, would you consider a sole propri proprietorship a smarter idea or LLC or a, an S Corp or a, you know what I mean? Do you have any opinions on how that's set up with you guys or for yeah. somebody starting out what they should do? When you start out um, a sole proprietorship, here's, here's the thing you got to understand though about how you set this business up. If you decide to change, you will have to reapply for your ATF license, for your FFL, because those are assigned to individual entities. So if you apply as a LLC, which is actually a pretty smart option, um, then your LLC is basically, hey, there's Garrett. Um, your LLC is basically uh, in charge of that FFL. Right. Now, you a sole proprietor, you're in charge of that FFL. Now, if you're a sole proprietor and then you decide to form an LLC down the road, you have to switch your license again, which isn't a, really a big deal. When you've already done that, it only takes about six or seven weeks, I believe, um, for the paperwork to process for a sole to LLC transfer setup. But it is a process because now you've got to get back to your distributors and give them all new licenses. And, and I mean, there's some work involved. Um, Starting out, though, LLC. If you have family that is going to be working with you, 
uh, I'm sorry, starting out sole proprietor. If you have family that's going to be working with you, sole proprietorship is definitely the way to go. LLC itself, you know, allows you to take on employees, but unless you're coming in with, you know, a million dollars right away and jumping into business and you can afford to pay, you know, people to wait out the slump that happens when you first start up, um, it's just smarter to be a sole proprietor and run a small outfit until you're ready to grow. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, and for those of you interested in a little bit additional information on that FFL transfer process, last month's webinar we had uh, Brandon Maddox from FFL123 on, and I know that we got into some of those questions. Um, so if you want to, they're all on the YouTube channel, the SDI uh, YouTube channel. Take a peek there. He, he gave some really good information on that transfer process in those types of situations. Same thing if you um, move addresses and all that good stuff. So if that helps at all, it is on the YouTube channel for you. Um, any idea on the initial cost of GearFire? Any startup uh, yeah. fees, anything like that? No, it's like you just pay 99 bucks and you give them your FFL and your logo and your distributors and your account numbers with those. And then you get set up with a, a payment processing system which mm -hmm. is somebody that they actually give you a list of, of people to call and you send them the same information and that's it. You spend like the 99 bucks that it takes to start the, the, the website. And it's okay. like, if you look at my website, it's pretty clean. I mean, it looks, it looks pretty good. Um, what's cool about it though, is you can go in anytime you want and there's pre-populated formats. So you can go in there and just switch it up and drop a whole new look to your website in mm -hmm. like five seconds. So, but it also gives you the back, there's the back end of, um, admin features where I can go in and drop whatever products I personally want to deal with. But yeah, it's cheap. I mean, that's, I found that and I was blown away that I didn't know about that earlier. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, okay, I've had a couple questions on ITAR. Uh, Kurt says an, the ATF inspector told me that I had to register with ITAR to manufacture. How did you get around that? Uh, I haven't manufactured a single weapon for sale yet. We're in the process of uh, developing our first 1911 right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can do any kind of customization work I want to, but what I can't do is build a lower, build an upper, put those two pieces together on an AR-15 because that makes me a manufacturer. Right. So the go between with that and the, it, the ATF hasn't ruled it yet. So it's still completely legal um, is you take and you take that weapon essentially um, and you sell it in two pieces. So you sell a lower separate from an upper. So what I have is options. My people can come in and I can build them a lower and I can sell them a custom lower with drop in trigger, whatever else they want. And then they can pick an upper basically to go with it. And they buy those as two separate pieces and you have to do it as a gunsmithing ticket to make it legal. So you have to take the weapon in, they purchase it, you take it back in, you do it as a gunsmithing repair and you do um, components as a gunsmith and then you sell them back the receiver or basically you give them back the receiver and it, it's kind of a process which is why I went through the 07 steps. Now as far as the ITAR stuff, that's where I'm at right now. I'm getting yeah. to that point, developing a weapon, we're going to have to go ahead and, and get involved with the ITAR. Um, the thing that bothered me about it was it's, it's so expensive to do it. So before I get fully involved, I'm going to have a good list of pre-orders of people that are interested that's going to cover that initial year cost. Yeah. Um, Jeff asks how hard it is to become a manufacturer, and I think that's probably a twofold answer that has to do with cost and headache. You know what I mean? Well, here's the um, thing. Is, um, if you've got the money to go buy a big CNC machine and do all that kind of stuff and manufacture that way, great. Um, if you want to be like 90% of the market, which is there's like what four or five different actual AR forging companies in the country. Mm -hmm. All you do is contact them with your FFL 07, give them a serial number range, give them a logo and say, I want these lowers and they'll make those lowers for you. And you'll pay about depending on the amount you do. Um, say you buy 
I don't know, um, 30 low, like 30 lowers at a time, you know, just to start. Those lowers are going to cost you anywhere from, depending on if it's CNC or if it's forged, they're going to cost you between 55 and $95 for a custom lower built to your specifications. So you can tell them exactly what you want out of it. So that eliminates a lot of the manufacturing costs right there. Um, and in a sense, you're still, you're just a builder. Um, but by the law, you're a manufacturer. So yeah. you can manufacture whatever you want from components. And that kind of harkens back to what you were talking about earlier with just about anything else. You know, let the let the people who know what they're doing and are established in that do it and then cross promote and partner, you know. Absolutely. You know, and the big thing that you can do too is a lot of people give discounts um, or charitable contribution stuff. So if you say, mm -hmm. Hey, look, I you know, I want to order twenty five of these things. Um, and here's what I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing these to raise money for, hey, that's my General Mattis poster. <laughs> I know. I General Mattis of Quantico, patron saint of chaos. Um, <laughs> so if I got any Marines out there, that one's for you guys. But uh, you, can, you can essentially never have to have a machine and still get everything you want. The only thing you have to do is the finish work, which is really the most important work anyway. You know, when you're, you're doing that 1911 and you're doing the accurizing, um, you're doing the fit and finish, you're doing the Cerakote work, all that stuff, you know, the fit and finish and the accurizing, you can do all that in-house and, you know, finesse it to make it personal for somebody. But the rest of the stuff, everybody's making it already. So just go and buy it. Right. Um, somebody did ask, uh, do you have a brief list of some of those lower manufacturers, the big ones? Uh, yeah, so there's a new company that's kicked off out of Texas that I really like, um, and they're very reasonable. Um, they'll put whatever logo you want on there, um, and that is called SWAT, S-W-A-T, SWAT Manufacturing, and they're out of Campbell, Texas. The other one that I really like is... Uh, Black Sword International. Black Sword is a veteran-owned company out of Knoxville, Tennessee. So I'm kind of partial to them because they're here and they're veteran based. Um, and they do forgings. So their lowers are forged. They're actually doing one for the CVMA right now uh, with our skull and spade logo. And it looks really cool. Cool. Um, Jeremiah wants to know if you would recommend Parkerizing in-house. And I guess that's okay. and, and let's expand that into all finishing work, you know. Right. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. That's another service that somebody already does that's been doing it for a long time and is much better yeah. than I am. I'm one of those people that's very much of the premise that I'm going to do what I'm good at and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to farm out the stuff that I know that I don't want to take a lot of time doing or the stuff that I'm not going to be great at. You don't want me behind a gun coating anything. You don't want me behind the spray gun you know, painting your kid's bicycle, I promise it's going to look horrible. So right, right. when it comes to any of that kind of stuff, the, the refinishing, I form it out to people who are amazing at their craft. Cool. And I've got, let's, um, because we're kind of dwindling, we've got a lot of people that have to jump off anyway. I have one, let me scroll through here and find this one question that I loved. Um, I think it's a great wrap-up question here. Give me just a quick second. Um, okay, Mark, who I think I know this name, and I think he asks this type of great question often. What are the key things that you learned um, through making mistakes that would help these guys from making mistakes in their own shop, either as one a one-person shop or a larger shop or just when you're starting out in business? You know, what are some of the stumbling blocks that you hit, basically, that, that you could share with them, you know, so that they wouldn't make the same mistakes? Yeah. Don't buy what you like, okay? That's, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's the biggest thing right there is you need to buy what the market says you need to buy. Do the research, see what's coming out, watch the trends, look at forums. Forums are a great place. People are always talking about stuff. You know, I'm not a Kimber fan, and, I, and everybody around here knows it. Um, I'm also not a Glock fan, and everybody around here knows that as well. Um, those are my own personal things, um, but I sell Glocks. And I just ordered some Kimbers because there are people that like them. The biggest mistake that I made when I first started was ordering a bunch of stuff that I thought was cool. But um, I realized quickly that, you know, 
not everybody thinks the same stuff is cool in the gun business because for different reasons, different people have different functionalities that they need. So that's a big one. Uh, the other one is learn your 4473 front to back. Learn the regulations that are involved in that because multiple sales, if you do a, a multiple sale, in, there has a paperwork, there's a secondary piece of paper you have to fill out and fax into the ATF within 24 hours of that sale or you're in violation. So if you sell two pistols in the same day um, to the same person, you have to fill out this piece of paper and fax it into the ATF. Uh, I wasn't aware of that right away because the ATF doesn't exactly come down and tell you everything that needs to happen. They just basically mm -hmm. show up and make sure that you're not a felon and that you're not crazy. And then they, they grant you your license. So there's a lot of legwork you have to do in learning the rules and regulations. The other, th the other thing that uh, you need to know that I didn't, I didn't mess this up, but I know people that have, is um, there's a, a company here locally that, that screwed it up, but it's um, you know doing a, what they call a straw purchase. So if a guy comes in with his wife and he tries to buy a gun and he gets denied, the very next thing that happens is they always want to know if the wife can do the paperwork. That's a no-no. That's going to get you in a lot of trouble. Um, basically, the biggest things are don't buy stuff you don't know or don't buy stuff that you like. Buy stuff that everybody else likes. Know your paperwork. That's going to hem you up. And I guess uh, overall, know your customer base and know the seasons. See, that's a big thing is seasonal sales. You have to know your slow seasons and you have to not overcommit to purchases in your slow seasons versus your prime season. In the gun business, your prime season starts around June and runs all the way to the end of the year. Then it dies between February and right now. So this is the slowest season right now. You're going to average in a small store anywhere from $1,000 to $2,000 a day in gross sales. But when it's kicking, you're going to get up to $8,000 to $10,000 a day more towards Christmas. It just You just got to know your market and know your base. Awesome. Um, what was the form you were talking about? Uh, the secondary form? Yeah. For the ATF. Uh, just a second. Let me grab it. Um, <laughs> I've got them right next to the 4473s. Yeah. 4473 is what you said you, you should know back to front, basically? Yeah, the 4473, if there's any mistakes on your 4473 and you get audited, audited by the ATF, the way that it works is you basically – can get put into purgatory. So they can suspend your sales. So if they come in and they audit your paperwork, they put dings on you for everything. It's like being in school. You didn't put the date. You didn't spell your name right. You didn't, you know, check that box properly. Right. Um, that, that right there can actually get you hemmed up by the ATF as well. Now, they're not out to get everybody, and there's a lot right. of leaning. Sure. But they have very strict regulations on the way that things are done. So if your paperwork's off, you can kind of get in trouble, um, and they'll put you in jail for a little bit, basically. Not real jail, but sales jail, where you can't sell guns for a while. Right. Um, that form that you're talking about is called a report of multiple sale or other disposition of pistols and revolvers. And Simple. basically, that, yeah, it's an ATF, <laughs> form, ATF form 3310.4. Dot four. Okay, they were right. Good job, guys. We had a couple guys chiming in with that. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's a big deal. Like, that's that's a – you've got to do that. Cool. Okay, I think I think that's it. I think we've done well. Um, uh oh, last last one. Are these forms handwritten or can they be typed, especially when it comes to dates, company names, et cetera? Okay, so here's one thing I like to do. There's a lot of automated forms through the ATF. Yeah. Um, I have my customers – Personally, here's, here's the ultimate thing. This is why I do it. Um, and I have my customers fill out their forms manually. I don't do any kind of pre-formatted forms. I don't have a database where they can come in and click on their name, and it signs them in, and their form's pre-generated. I have them fill out their forms individually because sometimes what's going to happen with the ATF is you're going to get, well, your local governing agency is the one that actually runs your, get your background check in your state for the customer that's purchasing a weapon. Um, you're going to get... A denial and when you get a denial on somebody one of two things happens they either well one of three things they either stay denied because they have something in their background that doesn't allow them to purchase a weapon at that time they either get accepted and you'll get an email telling you hey 
that purchase is good to go, contact your customer, here's your verification number, or they do what I don't understand, and it's the leave it up to the dealer option. And that basically just says, we're not saying yes or no, but if you feel like they're okay to have a weapon, it falls on your shoulders. So when my customers fill out their paperwork, I treat it like an interview because it's ultimately on my head if they purchase that weapon mm -hmm. and I give it to them. So I do their, I make them do their paperwork by hand. They fill out each 4473. All your 4473s have to be stored um, by month. And that makes it easier when they come in to do an audit. They can go through each of your paperwork by the month that they're in. But, yeah, I mean, I make them fill it out by hand because while I'm doing that, at any point in time, I can deny them if I feel like they're not safe or they're not buying a gun with good intentions. In states where you have mandatory wait periods like California, you know, you got to wait what is it, 15 days or something crazy like that for a pistol. Mm -hmm. um, that's the cooling off period. But in a state like Tennessee where you can come in, buy a gun, and walk out, it's really like a bartender. You're kind of judging that person's demeanor to know whether or not they should be purchasing that firearm. They come in here highly agitated and they want a gun and they're ranting and raving. I'm not going to sell it to them. Yeah. And that's because I don't want the liability of what happens after that gun leaves. So right. I use it as an interview process and I basically pre screen my customers. And I know all of my customers, so when I get new people in, it's always a new process. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think that's it. And I did want to share this along to you, Gabe. Um, Corey says, coming from a retired soldier, thanks for all you have done and all you do for us, brother. And I think that I'd like to echo that as well. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I appreciate your time tonight. Um, I, I think it was super cool listening to the way you go about things, it's very unique. Um, and, I, and hopefully everybody who's listening tonight got a bunch of information out of it too. So um, thanks so much for staying on with us. And all of you listening, it's 918. Thank you, 118 of you, for staying on late with us. <laughs> we really re appreciate it. Um, and like I said, hopefully you, you got good information out of it. Um, we will definitely try to have Gabe on again in a couple months, uh, kind of expand on some of these topics, um, maybe even look closer at the paperwork side of things. Um, if anybody has any suggestions or any, you know, wish lists on what you'd like to see in these webinars, email me, jennifer at sdi.edu. Just a reminder, if you do want that list, um, I'll, I'll go offline with Gabe and we'll get that, that list that we talked about at the beginning. Again, jennifer at sdi.edu. I will email all of you guys at once and BCC everybody. So. Um, Gabe, thank you so much. I truly, truly appreciate it. I'm glad you could be on with us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, just one thing I always offer up to any veteran out there, um, because I've been through it, is this this number, this 22 a day is a real number for anybody yeah. that's a veteran. It's a real deal. If there's any veteran listening that ever has an issue, call me. I will sit on the phone with you for as long as it takes to talk to you because it is near and dear to my heart. I've lost three friends to suicide, and I want to put a dent in that number. So I don't care if you just need a call or if you want to just come down here and spend a day because you need to get away. My doors are always open. My phone is always on. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Gabe. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Um, keep an eye out for the recording uh, over the next couple of days here. Facebook page, YouTube account, both of those will be updated probably tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and we'll be posting a bunch of stuff on the Facebook page about NRA as well. Now, for those of you interested in uh, field studying at Gabe's location there, uh, field study at sdi.edu. And otherwise, we would uh, just you know keep an eye out for next month's webinar as well. And um, we'd love to hear from you in the meantime. So thanks, everybody, for your time tonight. It was a great time. Uh, and we will talk to you next time. Thanks. Have a good evening. <laughs>